Welcome to Eye on Horror, episode 36, or season 2, episode 14. Uh, or I think we're going to call this our season 2 finale, just because this is as good of a a spot as any to call the finale Um, and we'll get to why as soon as I introduce your co-hosts but let me introduce myself first I am James J. Edwards your host and with me as always your other host Jacob Davison how you doing Jacob doing well and happy to be here for a celebration yes it is going to be a celebration Uh, and your other host John Correa is here to celebrate how you doing John doing well on this early rainy sunday in the beautiful los angeles area except it's monday but yeah Uh, long week (laughs) did did we just discuss how i never know what day it is but i'm always on time yeah it's a phenomenon so this episode we are going to basically it's the end of a decade and i know people always say the decade should run from 2011 to 2020 well no we're doing the teens and we're going to go through our favorite movies of the decade, of the teens, 2010 to 2019. And here are the rules. Um, We each have picked one movie per year. And in the interest of full disclosure, we have seen each other's lists. So there are no duplicates. So you're going to get three movies a year, different movies. And I'm just going to come out there and say it three movies a year is not enough because <laughs> it was we, so hard like yeah. how can you do this like we have uh, left some stuff off too many choices yeah i think the original conversation on when we brought up this topic started we, with me going fuck <laughs> we have to do this don't we because it's tough it's it's hard how do you pick your favorites yeah it is and uh as far as our favorites of the year go you've heard us talk about those and so you know, we, we decided to do this instead of a yearly list um, because, let's face it, those favorites of the year are generally the same 15 movies uh, that people talk about. So, you know, and you can read any of our lists on iHorror.com. So we're going to do our decade. So we're going to get right into it. We're going to skip uh, all the new stuff we've seen because no one wants to hear me talk about cats. And I don't think anybody, anything else has come out that's new. And we're going to skip... Uh, the subgenre because let's face it we're probably going to run long with we have a lot of stuff to cover so let's jump right into it let's go uh let's go alphabetical order by last name so we'll go korea davison edwards so start us off with your favorite of 2010 korea go uh this is the last time i'm going to say it but this is very tough picking one (laughs) um but for 2010, I went with I Saw the Devil. Um, I was lucky enough to have seen that in theaters. Um, I was actually managing the theater at the time. And I have to say, it's very rare for a movie to affect me so much. And that movie disturbed me to my core. And it, yes, there was violence. Yes, there was a lot of tension. But it was just how it dived into human nature and what it takes to push someone to that breaking point And... Uh, it's dude, just that greenhouse scene was just so much to take in, like just a beautifully crafted, disturbing film that haunts me. <laughs> cool. What do you got for us, Jacob, for 2010? All right. Well, I also want to preface uh, my selections went a bit more unconventional. And in retrospect, a lot of these I chose based off of uh, memorable theatrical screenings that I went to in experiencing them. So it's about it's uh, movies that made an impact on me and in many ways I feel made an impact on the horror scene at at their time of release. Uh, So 2010, I decided to go with uh, Alexander Asia's Piranha 3D. (laughs) Because, yes. uh, you know, this was a, uh, an ultra gory, sexed up version of the Joe Dante classic, but in 3D. And let me tell you, like, it was worth seeing in theaters every time. Like, me and my friends, uh, I used to work at AMC, so, like, I'd get free tickets, even though 3D was expensive. So uh, we'd just go back and forth, back and forth, seeing it again, because, like, you know, just seeing uh, the piranha text in 3D were just so fun. It's it's kinetic. It's got a lot of energy. So, you know, the, just to, so just in general, you know, I went for a choice that I feel like was one of the most fun movies of that year. How many times did you see it? Uh, I think I saw it at least four times in 3D. (laughs) 
Awesome. Uh, for for my 2010, um, I went with Adam Green's Frozen. Nice. Which for me, um, the thing about about movies like Frozen is, first of all, it's so simple. Three people on a ski lift, and they get stuck there. But also, that shit could really happen. Yeah. When you're watching Frozen and it happens, and you and and they they show kind of like open waters the same way. When they show how the count gets wrong and they get stuck in that chairlift, and you're like, "Oh, holy shit, that could happen!" And these people are stuck up there for a week. You know? Yeah. Yeesh. So, so Frozen and, is my 2010. Yeah, and I think Adam <laughs> Green's brought it up that he could say, uh, I've, you know, I've seen some interviews with Adam Green. I think he considers it one of his scariest movies because of that, you know, the plausibility. And I'm pretty sure this that sort of thing has actually happened and people have gotten like frostbitten or seriously injured. It, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, okay, Korea, what do you got for 2011? Um, 2011 was a tough year to pick from, not going to yeah. lie. Yeah. But... I, I went with the film that I thought was not only fantastic, but totally saved a franchise. And I p- went with Final Destination 5 because yes. I think it's the best one of the series, um, hands down. And that was before I and I didn't even know the twist. And I went and saw it like years later. And I was like, wow, why did I sleep on this? But not only that, just the jump in quality from the Final Destination 4 <laughs> and this <laughs> – was so immense like the franchise was kind of weaning a little bit with the third one but then the fourth one was almost unwatchable uh and then all of a sudden like i gave up almost i was like all right i got one more left let's do this and i watched the fifth one and holy crap it just brought everything back to the, the beginning literally but also just with the tension the kills everything about it the characters weren't annoying you actually like felt for them and stuff so yeah dude that movie was just like a lot of fun and it really knew what the franchise was and what needed to be done and i honestly think it's time for another one what about you jacob what about your 2011 all right well uh had to go with uh again something that made an impact on me and uh went with joe cornish's attack the block uh the sci-fi horror story about a uh, South London teen gang whose uh, block uh, becomes invaded by these horrible giant space bears that glow in the dark. I think dar- they're called gorilla wolf motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good way of putting it. And also the uh, debut of John Boyega of Star Wars. Um yeah, like this movie had a lot of heart and it had some incredible choreography because there's a lot of uh, elaborate sequences of them like gearing up and like running around uh, trying to avoid the the bear monsters, and it's just a very just such a well put together movie and it's funny and it's scary. It uh, manages to blend genres really well and it's got some uh, rather deep social messages. I followed in. Uh... Not, not really, because I think I made my list before him, but I followed in Korea's footsteps because I also chose a franchise movie. I've got Paranormal Activity 3 uh, as, oh. best one. as the best. It's easily the best Paranormal Activity movie, and I think it's one of the best movies of 2011. Um, just the fact that they went retro with it and they go back, you know, to give a little more backstory. And um, found footage is better, I think, with VHS <laughs> rather than uh than the the more high tech cameras and that fan cam yeah. the back and forth fan cam is uh yeah it's yeah totally genius all right 2012 korea go 2012 all right we're getting it. we're getting along guys this one was a tough one because it's like what year do you really oh. put this with yeah. um so i went with the year that it came out theatrically uh and i went with cabin in the woods like yes. that, it was just such a fun movie it was a nice fun d- dissection of the genre and everything that came before it um i really wish that it wasn't so spoiled so much in the trailers but you know it's it's hard to hate on a drew goddard production you know and uh yeah i just yeah cabin in the woods was like a d- def was one of my favorite things that I saw in theaters that year. And that was the year Avengers came out. So, you know. <laughs> And I also love that they released it on Friday the 13th in April so that the following week it uh, it had screenings on 420. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Significant if you've seen the movie. I do want to get that travel <laughs> coffee thing, even yes. though I don't smoke. Like, I just want to have that. It's just so amazing. 
All right, Jacob, what's your 2012? All right, again, we're going by theatrical release because some of these movies can just get so weird about it. But uh, I decided to go with the film debut of one of my favorite directors, Panos Cosmatos, Beyond the Black Rainbow. Uh, which to me is one of the scariest movies of all time. Like, uh, I remember seeing just the trailer and that like really messed with my head just is so terrifying. Like, you know, it, it does keep it ambiguous enough, but you know, you, you just get a hook of a premise like, uh, it's 1983, and a psychic girl is being held by a crazed psychologist in this weird science uh, science institute, and things start to fall apart. Like, it's a very intense movie. Uh, what really drives it home is it has, like, this incredibly haunting score by Sonoa Caves that, you know, uh, mix a synth, but there's also, like, some kind of omen-esque uh, kind of chanting music that pops up now and again and uh this one's very memorable for me because i saw it at the brattle theater in uh harvard square and i'll never forget that uh during this one scene with this kind of straight jacketed mutant uh it was so scary a woman behind me actually screamed out loud and fell out of her seat like it like it was just that it was that effectively terrifying uh you know, it's just, it, it really captures kind of the nightmare logic of, you know, because it's also kind of a 70s sci fi horror throwback. And it's a hell of a movie. Cool. My, uh, c- keeping in mind that I am the fringe horror guy, um, and I take a lot of crap for that <laughs> every year for my, uh, my top 10 lists. Um, my 2012 pick is Compliance, Ooh. which, uh, You've heard me talk about before, um, questionably horror, but once you realize that it really happened, it's really horror. And that's also another one of the reasons why I think I love it so much is similar to Frozen, you know, not only could compliance happen, it did happen. And it is, uh, it's just a really dirty, grimy, disturbing movie. Once I knew that uh, someone else would take Cabin in the Woods, uh, compliance automatically jumped into my number one spot for this year because uh it's 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 terrific uh korea what do you got for 2013 2013 man my 2013 choice was a movie i did not want uh i did not want them to remake the (laughs) evil dead (laughs) i actually even saw a social media post earlier of me ranting about ash vs. evil dead tv show and reassuring teenager me that you know the original remake they were going to do with um who was it? Uh, Kelso from that '70s show. <laughs> you know, way back in the day, is never gonna happen. But come 2013, you're gonna be very happy with the remake that came out, and it really was. Again, I can't stress this enough. I never wanted an Evil Dead remake, but holy shit, did they go for it? Fetty Alvarez brought such beautiful energy to the franchise and really put his own spin on it, while while keeping in line with the. Uh, what the original films were all about and just really taking it to the next level like holy shit it was literally raining blood (laughs) it was the bloodiest movie ever and it was also the most disturbing but he also brought a lot of uh stuff that makes sense it's like why are they at the cabin getting over a drug addiction stuff like that hit really hard not to mention just great performances all around what he did right was um the, the evil dead movies are also borderline comedies there there's yeah. you know slapstick and stuff but fede alvarez said he just said fuck that and he made it just this blood curdling pants shittingly scary movie um so that's another reason why it works so well because he didn't try to to copy the same tone as the originals no and like how his his version of the deadites was still deadites but like to the next level like he really leaned into no the deadites self mutilate themselves a lot and holy shit did they ever that fucking razor blade scene with the tongue oh it still gets me and the score for it i can't remember the composer's name off the top of my head but what a genius idea of using sirens in a in for a score in a space that's in the middle of nowhere it just added an extra level of just otherworldly but of urgency and terror because what's that's the most terrifying sound out there is sirens you know something's going wrong when those go off and to hear that when there's nothing around for miles is just that much more uh 
to the heart and core of terror. It really was fantastic. Cool. Uh, what's your 2013, Jacob? Well, I'm just going to kind of spoil my list and say this is actually my only franchise movie, but I decided to go with VHS 2. Nice. Which uh, I feel like is definitely the best of, of the series and had some of the uh, best segments overall. It just, in general, it was like a who's who of... Um, uh, of some of the best uh, directors of the 2010s. Uh, you got Adam Wingard, uh, Eduardo Sanchez and Greg Hale, uh, Timo Tianto and Gareth Evans and Jason Eisner. Uh, they, so we got uh, five five segments and it, it just is it such a good blend. Uh, like, of course, you got the framing device with the private investigators, uh, and then there's Adam Wingard's uh, ghost story, uh, clinical trials about the dude who gets the uh, cyborg camera implant in his eye, who actually is played by Adam Wingard. And then uh, it doesn't come up as much, but I like the segment right in the park with the zombies. You know, like the dude is like in the park and he's got a GoPro, he gets bitten by zombies. So it's basically you're watching a zombie movie from the perspective of a victim who gets turned into a zombie and then it it, it does kind of get into some dark comedy territories because like the zombie camera guy gets all kinds of damage like he's got a barbecue poker through his chest for a good chunk of the story uh but that and then of course the uh the big one uh i think probably the iconic one uh timo tiantos and gareth evans safe haven you know like the uh reporters go to check out this uh cult set out in the wilderness and it's like some uh big event is about to happen like it's some kind of religious events going to happen but uh they're about to get involved and shit goes crazy and then the uh final segment the slumber party alien abduction which is the actual name of the segment it jason eiser did hobo with shotgun so it's kind of wacky it's like you know a bunch of kids out in a cabin by the lake and see a bunch of lights Aliens attack. Is that the one where the camera's on the dog? Yes, I was just about to say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the, it again, is. it's a very interesting uh, way of doing the found footage side of things, you know, having the camera on the dog of all yeah. things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, just each each segment really holds on their own. It's a good display of some really great directors and actors, and uh, it's... One of my favorite uh, found footage movies of the decade. My 2013, and uh, I have a feeling I got to this one before you guys did, and that's how I got it, <laughs> The Conjuring. <laughs> um, he, there, there was no race for me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> the Conjuring, for me, is... Um, it was just it's such a great throwback to like 70s, and part of it is because it's set in the 70s, and it has the Warrens. Yeah. But uh, it's just a nice throwback to those haunted house movies of the 70s, and... Yeah, I just loved it. And and the the most memorable thing for me about The Conjuring is the trailer because rather than just try to cut a trailer that does that that to reel people in, they give you an entire scene from the movie which is the clapping, you know, the hide and clap Ooh, yeah. scene. And that's all you needed was, you know, to reel people in. You didn't need to, you just give them this one scene and that's uh I mean it, it hooked me. And luckily the movie uh lived up to the hype of the trailer at least for me i know uh i think korea differs on that but no it, it's it's a it's a phenomenally made and very effective horror movie you know my personal feelings aside on all that it is it, it, it's very effective it's very scary yeah all right i give credit where credit's due let's move on to 2014 <laughs> korea what do you got 2014 all right that, that was a great year by the way that was yes, that was probably was. one of the toughest years to pick one and to let everyone know i was the last one to make my list even though i i proposed this topic <laughs> uh i'm lazy and waited until the last minute to do it uh but this was one of the hardest years to pick like i was seriously sitting there at two o'clock in the morning cursing the other two out for leaving me <laughs> with having to choose between two phenomenal films but ultimately, I had to go with The Babadook. Such an incredibly well-made film. The acting was so on point. The Babadook himself is terrifying, even if you don't really fully see him. But it was just such a phenomenal uh, film. Absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely phenomenal film. What do you got, Jacob? All right. Well, 2014 had to go with uh, one of my favorites of the of that year, 
uh, What We Do in the Shadows. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jermaine Clement and Taika Waititi. Just because yeah. it it's the ultimate vampire movie, really. It's uh, about a group of vampires of differing ages and backgrounds who uh, live together in a mansion in New Zealand. And it's a uh, shot documentary style, you know, trying to examine their lives and what they do. And... You know, the uh, pros and cons of being a vampire, uh, uh, major con being you can't get into a club without getting invited in first. Um, you can't eat french fries. <laughs> you, you can't eat yeah. chips. He ate the chip. <laughs> My favorite part of that is when they're watching um, the sunrise on YouTube. <laughs> that's the only way. <laughs> yeah. That was, such a beautiful, that was such an innocent and beautiful scene where it's like, it has been a few hundred years since these people have seen this. Yeah, that's the thing I love about it because, uh, you know, a big... Uh, a big uh, part of the movie is them kind of getting used to the modern world and uh, this takes place uh, after like they feed on some people and that's the thing like the feeding scene like they lure some people in for their familiar uh, this this woman that works uh, that works for the bad boy deacon and the se- the sequence where they stock uh uh, where they stalk uh, Nick around the house, like that is actually a pretty good horror sequence. Like, oh. and I love when uh, oh he never gets the face right when he turns. Into yeah, a Vladislav cat. turns into a cat, but it's still got his face. And uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it's speaking a, of cats, <laughs> yeah, it just it's a great examination of uh, vampire genres as a whole because you got like kind of the Nosferatu vampire, you got your Hammer vampires, you got your classic romantic uh, and Rice type vampires. So it's like it's just uh, examining the different types of vampires and genres over the years by having them live together and just kind of, uh, you know, examining that type of character. Oh, yeah. Did you guys ever notice that the not being able to change the face when turned into a cat? kind of explains medieval paintings about how <laughs> where they could never yeah. get a cat's face right and made it too human like almost implies they were all vampires who suck at transforming uh for me 2014 was really easy because my pick and keep in mind i'm the fringe horror guy my pick for 2014 is also the best movie of the decade in general it's nightcrawler nightcrawler it's just this dirty gritty just you know i mean jake gyllenhaal was was robbed for an oscar nomination for nightcrawler but i I also think nightcrawler should have won all the oscars that year um it's just this you know great it it shows the two sides of la you know the dirty grimy side and then the glitzy glowing side and it um it's just yeah i just think Nightcrawler is a masterpiece, and it's uh, not only the best movie of 2014, but the best movie of the 2000 teens. For James. First of all, no, no. Nightcrawler is incredible. It is honestly one of the best movies out there, and that score is fucking terrifying. And so is Jake Gyllenhaal. Oh, like that is such a – it's terrifying. We we keep saying because it's real – that is like those people exist there's someone out there that acts like jake gyllenhaal in that movie and that's just who they are that's a terrifying uh thought to have but yeah nightcrawler absolutely phenomenal actually just bought five copies of it from dollar tree so <laughs> that's a uh, stocking stuffers this season absolutely Sp- spread that around okay 2015 <laughs> what do you got korea 2015 was another tough year. Uh, all the years were tough, but um, but there could only be one. And being from New England, I had to go with the New England uh, folk tale, and I went with The Witch. So I saw this in theaters and remember being immediately sucked in how this was kind of like a horror gothic retailing of The Crucible. And just the performances from the humans were phenomenal but the animal acting like that needs to be a category because black philip was just so good like, speaking of oscar snubs right yeah. uh, that goat was incredible like it made me want to own a goat because goats are cool but like i'll settle with naming my neighbor's black kid do, do you want to own that goat though yeah black philip <laughs> I Who named my neighbor's Black cat Phillip. Black Phillip. It's not its name, but it's Black Phillip to us. He's an adorable little guy. But uh, <laughs> yeah, dude, the witch is just so unsettling and so, and it's so great, especially growing up in New England. You hear uh, like the witch trials 
was such a big part of our history and to see it be represented so well and how it could happen and they put little things in there to show like how this happened like the whole thing with the with the moss and the and the mold you know having the psycho uh effect on people and stuff like it's just a phenomenal movie that every time i go back and rewatch it there's always something else i pick up on and yeah when you finally see black philip in his true form whoa, so good cool what do you got for us jacob all right well uh decided to go with the meta slasher movie the final girls uh yeah the story of uh a woman whose uh, mother was a scream queen who died in a tragic car accident. So they decided to go, go to uh, a screening of her movies. She she was in like these kind of Friday the 13th type slasher movies. And there's a fire in the theater. And by twist of fate, they're sucked into the movie like her and a few of her friends. So they have to kind of figure out how to kind of navigate all the tropes and uh, get out without getting killed. And it's just very clever, you know, just kind of playing with uh, the cliches and kind of the styles at the time. Well, also, it's got a lot of heart because, like, she's in the movie and she's with her mom, although it's a, a character her mom plays. So just so it's kind of dealing with loss and tragedy. And yeah, just it, re- it really struck it's really struck a nerve with me in the best way possible. My 2015 is one that kind of came out of nowhere and uh it's Karen Kasama's The Invitation. And uh, it's one of those movies that if you've never heard of it, you're lucky because it's best to go into The Invitation with little to no knowledge of the movie. It's one of those kind of movies because every little bit of exposition is crucial to how the movie actually winds up. So, you know, I don't really want to go too much into plot wise, but it's it's basically it's about a dinner party that goes horribly wrong. That's, you know, <laughs> all we'll say. But it's uh, it's it's one of the most clever movies and one of the also one of the most disturbing movies, I think, of the 2000 teens. So that's the invitation. So moving on to 2016. What do you got, Korea? Tough year. Tough year, of course. Another tough year. <laughs> uh, spoilers, James stole mine, but, you know, oh. got to gotta give up at least one or two in, with this type of thing. Hey, that's the price you pay for uh, doing your list last. Hey, also, <laughs> your, yours yours makes more sense for you, too. So, I, you know, yeah. I'll, give, I'll, give, I'll give you that. Um, but, man, 2016 was such a phenomenal year. I had to go with Train to Basan. Um, Good call. You know, not only was it uh, so tense, like you're just sitting there in this uncomfortable state the entire time, but it's such an emotional journey uh, that you're on throughout the film. And I'm one of those people that's kind of, uh, I don't, I haven't lost faith in the zombie genre, but like it's definitely a bit tired. Um, so, so I'm a little bit uh, pessimistic when I go to watch a new zombie film, but. When when a when a good one comes out, it needs to be celebrated because it is a bit of a tired genre. But holy shit, uh, Train to Busan was absolutely phenomenal and tugged at the heartstring. Like I remember crying at the end. Like it's yeah. such a phenomenal film, and it's so hardcore. Like uh, I love cl- close encounter uh, scenes and just being stuck on a train in that situation. It was nothing but that. Absolutely phenomenal film. Yeah. What do you got, Jacob? All right, well, one of my favorite movies of 2016 would have to be The Void. Yeah, like, I've, I've always been a fan of Astron 6, and this has made a couple of their alumni, the uh, Canadian genre uh, collective. Uh, this was directed by Jeremy Gillespie and Stephen Kostansky, and it's, ba- it's basically uh, just kind of a, in general, 80s horror homage it's about this uh cop who finds this guy on the road who's bleeding he takes him to a hospital that's basically shutting down and all of a sudden the hospital is surrounded by a bunch of white robed weirdos with knives with these black triangles on their faces and shit gets crazy it's got amazing practical effects like some of the best i've seen in years steven kostansky is an extremely talented uh, practical effects artist and uh you know, it just it, it it does a great job in never really outright referencing its influences, but like wearing it on its sleeve. Uh, like it's got a great synth score. It's uh, got kind of the moods and colors of um, Hellraiser movies, and uh, it definitely has that John Carpenter film vibe. Uh, just it 
really it really resonates and you know it's definitely something you can tell uh the creators are fans and uh they know what they were after korea kind of tipped uh my hand a little bit um saying that it's that it makes more sense for me to pick this movie than him but um as a recovering punk rocker <laughs> who has played in bands for years uh my pick for uh 2016 is green room and it is uh it you know not that we ever got into a situation like that but there were you know as a touring punk rock band in the 90s there were times when you would pull up to a place in you know Fayetteville Arkansas and you know you pull up to load in and you're like is this gig gonna be okay <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it, and we never got into as much trouble as the guys in green room did but there were you know it, it did kind of bring back some memories you know when that I'm like you know you know this, this could have happened to us if we had pulled into the wrong club at some time you know at some point in time but yeah anton yelchin uh one of his last movies it, and the music you know of the band the ain't rights i mean these guys they go into this nazi club and they play a cover of dead kennedy's nazi punks fuck off yeah. <laughs> and that's not even where they got into trouble <laughs> that seemed to earn them respect with these skinheads oh yeah, I, I I love Green Room, and and I was happy that I was able to steal it from out from under Korea for this list. <laughs> Emotional wreck of a film, like <laughs> just uh, <laughs> hits you at the core. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on to 2017. When now we're getting into uh, in into, okay, and I'm going to say my three picks. Spoiler alert: are my three favorite movies from these years. So I. I kind of got lucky with these three, but let's go on to Korea for 2017. Can I just say, I, I fucked up when I first started making my list and I started with the year 2000 <laughs> <laughs> and I actually did make uh, like top tens for the last 20 years. So, but that's for a much longer episode. Um, but <laughs> I, I have to say, dude, like this last decade was so much harder than the first decade of the 2000s. The first 10 years was like just trying to find 10 that were good but like these years were so hard and like especially the more recent we got like the quality in horror has gone up so much and i don't think people recognize that enough that like how like just the editing of the early 2000s and late 90s like i was watching stigmata the other day and like as much as i like that film the editing sometimes is a bit much that very 2000s music video -y. but i digress uh 2017 i went with killing of a sacred deer um I know, I know. I went with a fringe one. Sue me. Sorry, James. Uh, but <laughs> God, that movie just made me feel like I was in the middle of like a flu the entire time. Just this very sickly, uneasy, no idea what was going on. I went into that movie so blind. All I knew is that Colin Farrell and this creepy kid and I was – not even close to figuring out what was going on throughout most of that film and it's and i love films that have such a physical effect on on me when i watch it and that one i just felt like i was having like a fever hallucination the entire time and it's well, still the reason sticks that, with me. the reason the reason you can't figure out what's going on in that movie is because what's going on doesn't make any sense um it's not it you know it, it's almost like yorgos plays with with reality he plays with the rules of reality so you're like you know this can't happen but why is it <laughs> and and on top of that you have such unreliable narrators yes um, yeah not only from the camera but the characters themselves everyone's telling a bit of a different story and even at the end when it all comes together you're still left sitting there going is it did it what was really real that happened there and am I just having an acid flashback throughout this entire fucking movie? I don't know what's going. On. It's it's just yeah. Oh, and that then the performances that that kid. Oh, god damn, dude! I don't know where they found him, but damn, Yorgos is a master. That's another one, another movie that has just this great trailer because the trailer is pretty much just, and it's a scene from the movie where the girl sings. I think it's a Kasha song, um, like a cappella. And that's the soundtrack to the trailer. And they show scenes from the movie, but there's this creepy, you know, 
little girl singing, not little girl, teenage girl singing a Kasha song over it. And you're like this, you know, it just really ropes you in. It's a uh, crazy. What do you got for, for us, Jacob on 2017? All right. Well, for 2017, I had to go for the genre busting Dave Made a Maze. <laughs> it's a pretty simple yes. premise, and it is just so weird. I love it. Uh, so basically, it's about this guy named Dave. Go figure. And Not uh, just a clever name. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, so ba- basically, his girlfriend, uh, Annie, uh, it, it goes out for the weekend, and uh, Dave's an artist, but he's going through terrible writer's block. He doesn't have a job. He's feeling depressed. So to express himself, he decides to make a cardboard maze. And at first, you know, it looks just like a kind of a little cardboard fort. But when Annie comes back, uh, she hears Dave's voice come out of the cardboard box saying that he's trapped in his maze and to not destroy it because otherwise she'll kill him and uh, to not come into the maze because it's too dangerous to save him. So Annie gets a bunch of her friends and also a hobo and some Flemish tourists for some reason and uh their and their friend Harry uh decides to document the movie or document the whole event and he's played by uh one of my favorite comedians James Urbaniak and they go in and it turns out the maze is way bigger on the inside because they go inside the cardboard fort and it's basically this massive cardboard world filled with like uh cardboard creatures like living origami birds and uh there's there's a a minotaur yeah a cardboard minotaur (laughs) and all kinds of deadly traps and because what maze is complete without a minotaur (laughs) true true and it's the only reason why i don't own a maze because (laughs) minotaurs in this type of climate they're just too expensive you know (laughs) the feeding expenses absurd it's the thing though is that it's it's very funny but also can be very weird and disturbing and surreal because like people do actually die in this movie but the gore is replaced with arts and crafts so like somebody gets their head chopped (laughs) off with a with a cardboard guillotine and like uh red confetti flies out of their neck and like glitter yeah yeah yeah. so it's it's just very fun and it's interesting because you know at the at the end of the day it's really kind of a examination on the creative process and you know the frustration of you know trying to get by creatively and a very underrated movie cool well we're gonna go from underrated to rated perfectly uh my favorite from 2017 is jordan peele's get out and uh, Get Out, I think, uh, I mean, it, it's very highly regarded amongst most film fans, and I think it deserves every bit of praise it gets. It's um, it's it's not only a really spooky, you know, scary movie, but it has a lot to say socially, um, which is the same with Jordan Peele's movie from 2019, Us, which, spoiler alert, didn't make any of our 2019 lists, but it is... Uh, we still love it. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, like I said, you know, when you're going one movie a year things fall through the crack which we will get to but uh no get out (laughs) get out to me was just i mean i i went into it not knowing anything about it which is kind of becoming my mo with movies because you know ari aster movies i never want to know anything about and i think jordan peels might be that way too because it's uh i don't know just get out i think it's uh, i think it's a masterpiece i'm using that word a lot today but when you're talking about the best movies of every year that's what you do uh okay korea what do you got for 2018 now we're, we're getting to years that we've been doing this podcast i think we yeah, started yeah. in 2018 so these these next six choices of ours shouldn't come to any surprise uh, to, <laughs> to our avid listeners but you know what you we're, could probably guess what they are if you yeah, are an avid listener yeah, <laughs> oh, but yeah. we're going to discuss them anyways because you know it's yeah. the format of the episode uh, <laughs> 2018, another very tough year. Um, you know, for 2018, I went with Hereditary. I actually didn't yes. catch this one in theaters. I was traveling a lot and just missed out on it, especially since I was trying to avoid anything about this movie before seeing it. And it, it's one of those movies that I'm watching at home for the first time, and I, I had to pause. And that's, and it's not just pause to go to the bathroom. I mean, like something happened and I paused. And we and know, I know exactly. Oh what yeah, scene. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I actually went and saw it. I saw a press screening and then I went back opening night because I wanted to watch the audience during that scene. Yeah. And anybody who's seen it knows the scene. Oh, yeah. The scene. And anybody who hasn't seen it, what are you waiting for? Go see Hered here. Okay. <laughs> but, but seriously, it was it was such a pause worthy thing. And me and my fiance were just sitting there going, is, is, is she on the outside? Is she on the inside? 
oh no we're both right <laughs> you know and and it just didn't stop even like when it was do even when it wasn't doing you know it's horror thing with the wall crawling or the cold thing just the emotional toll that was happening on these characters in watching this family d- dynamic break down was just so hard to watch because there's there's truth in that that you know there's there is these thoughts that you know some family members have and stuff and to see it just come out and come out so hard like just the scene where she's standing and uh, Tony Collette's character is standing in her son's bedroom and he's like, "What are you doing?" And she just starts spilling like her thoughts out and stuff, which is such an emotional wreck. Um, absolutely phenomenal. And you know what? To everyone who says like, "Oh, it's just a family drama," yeah, it is a family drama, but it is also horror as fuck. I mean, there's a cult and shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as if we even need to ask, but. <laughs> Jacob, what's your number one for 2018? <laughs> I'm wearing a Cheddar Goblin hat as we speak. <laughs> Wait, so, you like that movie? <laughs> uh, yes, no, it's it's Mandy. It had to be Mandy. <laughs> like, I don't, like, I, I was even contemplating not doing it because, you know, like, I already got Panos Cosmatos and Beyond the Black Rainbow for 2012, but I, I, could, I, gotta, I gotta have it on there. Uh, Mandy was my favorite movie of 2018 in general, and quite frankly one of the most kinetic uh theatrical experiences that i've had uh i got to see it at beyond fest um and you know it was the peak jewel of the nicholas cage assance we've been experiencing and you know it's a pretty simple premise uh you know it's like uh it takes place in the early 80s and nicholas cage plays this uh lumberjack who's living with his girlfriend mandy and they're out in the woods just you know having a nice romantic idyllic uh, uh, life together and then this cult uh, and, like this kind of Manson-esque cult ha- sets their eyes on Mandy and after they attack Nicolas Cage vows brutal horrible terrifying and oftentimes surreal revenge and, like it's it's just such a heavy metal movie like he arms himself with a crossbow and the most gnarly axe sword i've ever seen it's powerful like i can't really think of much else to say about it just it really grips you even though it's like a couple hours long like just every every bit is so you know, so compelling okay cool i'm a my 2018 pick is you know and again if you've been listening to the podcast you know a Quiet Place is my favorite movie from 2018. And A Quiet Place, you know, similar to what Jacob was saying about um, his theatrical experience, A uh, Quiet Place was similar for me. It's like it, people always would say with A Quiet Place, the, the movie is essentially silent for most of the movie because it's about living in a world where the monsters are attracted by sound. So everybody's got to be silent. And people would say, you know, oh, doesn't it ruin it? Be, watching it with other people in the theater, it's like, no, because the movie is so engaging that, I mean, people are walking out with three quarters full tubs of popcorn because they were afraid to eat, you know, because they might crunch and disturb this carefully crafted silence. And, uh, you know, again, I'm going to use the word again. A Quiet Place is a masterpiece. It's, you know, John Krasinski, uh, you know, this is Jim Halpert. You know, <laughs> directing, you know, and uh, starring in. Sorry, he's Jack Ryan now. <laughs> um, get it right. Yeah. Okay, we are now at 2019, and there's still a week left in 2019, so th- this list could change. So we'll yeah. have to get back to you. But it, with, you know, 51 of 52 weeks done of 2019, yeah. Korea, what's your 2019 choice? Again, it's so tough. We had such a phenomenal year. There's so yeah. many there's been so many moments where I've been wanting to say, you know, just quickly throw in a few titles, you know, just to be like, oh yeah, well I wanted to pick this just to kind of as like a cop out to not pick to for not picking something. And this was definitely one of those years like right now I'm really fighting the urge of not name dropping like three or four titles. Um but like as far as um movies that i had no expectations for at all like almost every good movie that came out this year i was excited for as far as a film i'm gonna use the same type of language i said with evil dead i did not want this movie i did not want this book i did not want this movie uh doctor sleep really blew me away 
Um, and just as an achievement of not only adapting its source material, but finding that perfect balance of, again, not only adapting its source material, Dr. Sleep, the book, but balancing the act of the world that Kubrick created with the shining movie and what King was doing with the books and like the mythology that was very well established in the books, but weren't really that mentioned in the, in the shining movie was a phenomenal feat. And on top of all that, you still have a very beautifully looking film and Mike Flanagan really did a phenomenal job of working with the actors and flushing out almost every single person on the screen. There were side characters that had great arcs in that film, whether it was like the old vampire that passed away and you see everyone emotional that. Oh man, dude, Re- Rebecca Ferguson was just absolutely a force to be reckoned with uh, in that film. And of course, you know, Ewan McGregor is my ultimate man crush and he, yeah. he can do no wrong. So <laughs> he was phenomenal. But damn, dude, that was just such a such a beautiful movie. My fiance was crying throughout a, a good portion of that movie. She was so uh, in love with it. So I couldn't I could not not mention that movie. I'm glad that we got a Mike Flanagan movie on our best of the decade because he, in my opinion, is one yeah. of the modern masters of horror. Yeah. Um, and we left him off until now. So I'm glad that we got Dr. Sleep on there. I mean, yeah, he he was one of those ones that was tough to like not mention. I mean, uh, I'm trying not to name drop titles again, but yeah, it, it was, it was, yeah. Again, didn't want it. And now I can't wait to watch a three hour cut of it. Ha ha ha. Cool. Uh, what do you got, Jacob, for 2019? All right. Well, uh, this again, this was a very tough choice. So many great movies this year. Um, I had to go with another Spectre Vision film, and that was Daniel Isn't Real by Adam Egypt Mortimer. And, cool. Uh, yeah, if you don't know, this was about a um, a, a dude in college. His name's Luke. Um, and he's played by Miles Robbins, the son of Tim Robbins. Um, That's Tim Robbins' son? Really? Because um, the actual Daniel is Schwarzenegger's son, right? Yeah. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that that was Tim Robbins' son. Wow. There you go. Second generation. Okay. Now, sorry to interrupt you. I just didn't realize that was Tim <laughs> Robbins' kid. Okay, cool. Yeah, there's Carry no on. problem. But uh, So it, it is kind of funny how that how that goes but anyway yeah so he's uh, having a lot of difficulties mentally and socially and he decide and he, he ends up at home with his uh, mentally ill mother and uh, while there he uh, resurrects his old uh, imaginary childhood friend Daniel who who helps him for a lot of situations like he uh, helps him become more socially active helps him with school and they, he seems to be his best friend but there is a real dark side to Daniel and he starts to take over Daniel's life and soon his body so it's uh, so it's got that kind of Ari Aster uh, vibe in, de- in dealing with uh, mental illness through horror but also it has a real David Cronenbergian edge to it because it, there's a lot of body horror with uh, Daniel you know uh, you know, it, trying to interact in the real world through uh, Luke's body and it gets pretty crazy um it just uh has amazing visuals you know because like there's the imaginary world and the real world and uh the, the kind of things that uh daniel does uh, to uh mess with luke or, or you know to go about that like you know imaginary friends is a fairly common horror trope uh you know just something to that but look i, I think this is probably my favorite uh, take uh, take on that trope with with imaginary friends because it, it there are some twists and turns, and it goes to some pretty crazy places. Cool. Well, my uh, my 2019 pick, and uh, you brought up Ari Aster, and Korea used uh, Ari Aster's first movie, Hereditary. Well, Ari Aster's second, Midsommar, is my uh, pick for 2019. Um, so Ari Aster's two for two on our uh, all decade list. Um, Midsommar I'm the king of the 80 minute slasher nothing makes me happier than seeing a runtime of less than 90 minutes but Midsommar is two and a half hours and I've watched it four times oh, wow. and one of those times was the director's cut which is three hours and every time I have loved it so it's not 
I don't mind long movies as long as they don't feel long. And Midsommar to me does not feel long. I just think it's, it's uh, you know, again, I sound like a broken record, but it's a masterpiece. It's just masterful filmmaking. And, you know, Ari Aster and Jordan Peele both, I pretty much am going to watch anything they make for the rest of their career just based on the strength of their first two movies. Um, but yeah, Midsommar, is, uh, it's it's my number one for 2019. Wow, we did it, guys. We, we got through We got through 30 films. And we didn't name drop any other woods, like no. But we're going to now. Yeah. Yes, there are some also rands that um, that we can't believe the other guys didn't say, and we didn't say. I, I'm going to go first. I think the biggest surprise for me that no one has said is your next. Yeah, yeah, that was a um, tough one to leave off. I'll be honest, but, but but also that was a tough one because also between production and release it was like three years yeah. and so you don't know what year to put it in and also the years that it fell in were pretty competitive so it doesn't surprise me that i got left off but it does because it's terrific so <laughs> yeah what, what about you guys what are the what are the surprises that you know were left off oh man where did where to begin yeah um, <laughs> like uh shit dude the guest i'll be honest oh yeah and i was more surprised with that one because it when i was making my top tens for each year i forgot what year that came out and so i didn't and i didn't like even think about it and as we were talking i was like oh fuck why didn't anyone bring up the guest it's such a phenomenal movie it's literally what if captain america was a slasher killer you know uh for me i was very on the fence about this but uh you know like i had to uh, I kind of I wish I could have put it on uh, Tragedy Girls. I thought that that was one of my favorites of the decade. Uh, came out twenty seventeen, but it is just such a clever uprooting of the slasher genre and making uh, the Tragedy Girls uh, the monsters, the villains. So it's uh, it kind of got a Nightcrawler ish vibe to it, but in the social media age. I struggled with two thousand nineteen um, between Midsommar and Us. Oh yeah. Um, but but I think Midsommar is the stronger movie, but it does it did hurt me a little to not include Us because I think Us is terrific as well. Yep. Yeah. Also, Crawl. I uh, wish I could. Oh yeah. I, I love Crawl. Uh, it couldn't fit it in, but it was one of my favorites of the year. Oh yeah. For me, um, one of the ones that I was very dis like it more. It wasn't surprised to that other that you guys didn't bring up, but there was a bunch that I was very disappointed that I couldn't bring up because of like the heavy hitters like 2015 we couldn't bring up the gift because that was just such a strong year between you know the witch green room all that the gift is a phenomenal film and i think um you know it it needs to be talked about more especially since that was joel egerton's first feature length and he did such a phenomenal job of not only directing and acting in it it really kept you in a very similar space of uh, the killing of a sacred deer. Not to that extreme, but in that sense where you don't really know what's real, who, who, which narrative to trust. Uh, that was, yeah, that was one of the ones I was a little sad to leave off. And also that same year, I think, is the It Follows year, which um, it's almost a crime that we had to leave It Follows off. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, no, because It Follows was uh, Year of the Babadook. That was 2014. Oh, got it. So that was the year yeah. before. Okay. That's another one of those festival versus wide release ones that got kind of ambiguous. But yeah, It Follows is another that fully deserved to be on this list. We just couldn't find a place for it. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, it, that was the one that I was swearing at you guys about at two o'clock in the morning. I was like, you really going <laughs> to make me choose between Duke and It Follows? You bastards. Um but yeah, I mean, even like 2018, we couldn't mention, uh, no, one of us couldn't mention Halloween. Uh, Annihilation was one I wanted to bring up, but I just couldn't, yeah. you know, with, with Hereditary. I was like, fuck, you guys had to had to leave me, like, someone had to bring up Hereditary, and you just had to make that me. Uh, man, Overlord was a lot of fun. Upgrade was oh, a yeah. lot of fun. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap this up, because we have run long, although I'm impressed that we got through uh, 30 minutes in about an hour, or 30 movies. I'm impressed we got through 30 movies in about an hour. So let's get out of here. Um, our uh, our music is Restless Spirit. So, you know, throw your devil horns up for them. Yeah. And our, our artwork was by Chris Fisher. So go and show him some love. 
Uh, where can we find you guys on the Twitters? Jacob? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jacob Davison underscore. That is at J-A-C-O-B-D-A-V-I-S-O-N underscore. Uh, you can also find uh, my writing in uh, Dead Time Stories, uh, the Horror Anthology podcast uh, on iTunes and Google Play. That is Dead Time Stories. You can tell uh, it from the uh, purple background with the skull. Cool. And and you, Korea? Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Korean Barbecue. That's C O R R E I A N B B Q. Uh, you can also find me on the Stardust app for iHorror. And uh, recently directed a wrote and directed a two minute one shot uh, called Disconnect. Uh, you can check that out on YouTube. I think we shared it on our page, but uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun to make, and uh, hope people enjoy that. That was part of that 1917 one shot challenge, wasn't it? Yeah, we we didn't yeah. we didn't win. Uh, understandably so. Who who goes for genre films? Uh, but you know, uh, there was a lot of talent that was displayed from all the all the competitors for the contest. Uh, and I'm still proud of our short man. Like, oh no, yours is terrific. There's this one. It it does some real 1917 stuff because you go off a balcony, down a window, and up a stairwell, and it's one one shot. You're, yeah, it, it's it's pretty impressive filmmaking. I I mean, not yeah. being there for it, I'm I'm wondering how you did some of it. Oh, it's uh, the ingenuity of my DP, John O'Connor, who I've worked with <laughs> a lot over the years. Um, that dude, like we, we approached the thing and the concept uh, and, you know, luckily we had three different mindsets that came together really well. Our producers were VFX wizards, so they really wanted a lot of VFX stuff. Our DP wanted to pull off a very impressive stunt like that with the camera, which he did. And I wanted to tell a a good story with uh, good actors. So, you know, got my buddy Antoine, who I've been wanting to work with for years on that. So a lot of forces came together to create something that was pretty fun. Uh, I think we told a lot of story within two minutes. So, you know, I'm really proud of it. And me, uh, you can find at Cinema Firite. That's like uh, Verite, but with fear. So it's F-E-A-R-I-T-E. And you can find all three of us at the Eye on Horror Facebook page or the Eye Horror Facebook page or at iHorror.com where we all, uh, I'm sure that we're all going to have top 10 lists up there. So if you were, if, if you want to see just 2019, you know, and, you know, see three lists that are probably going to all be very similar, uh, you can, <laughs> uh, you could check that out. Uh, so yeah, uh, for me, James J. Edwards. I'm Jacob Davison. And I'm Jonathan Korea. Keep your eye on horror. Oh hey, so uh, so if you're still listening, you listen to the whole song, which is great. Express the spirit is great, but I bet you were thinking we were going to mention Rampage, huh? Bet you did. Well, we didn't. Yeah, all right, and we're proud of us because we didn't mention Rampage once in this whole list. Rampage out now on Blu-ray, DVD, and digital from Warner Brothers. All right, check it out.